You know, I uh, recently discovered, uh, Coach, thanks to this episode everyone's about to listen to, that the gut controls everything, including your thoughts, feelings, emotions. And society. And society. Uh, really, if you've ever watched that episode, and I'm going to start throwing in, if it's cool, more Star Trek references, but The I Next Generation. Oh, yeah, I'm good Picard's- with Next Picard is awesome. Number is one. He, is he your... Very well, number one. He's got the bridge. He's my captain. So he is your captain? He's my captain. Oh, captain, oh, yeah. my captain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so for him, uh, there's that episode where uh, some parasitic aliens control the admirals. Remember, when they take over? Yep. So kind of like that. That's a ba- Is that an accurate assessment of what everyone's about to listen to, the role of the gut and the gut microbiome? Yeah, what we learned from Gabrielle Fondaro, our awesome guest, yep. uh, was, or Fondaro, actually. Fondaro. Yeah, you pronounced it right. I got it wrong the whole time and still did. <laughs> and uh, you met her in person. E- e- even a she week later, <laughs> shout out Gabs, still don't know your name, um, was that it is not actually the reptilian overload, overlords that control society. Right but certain strains of gut bacteria. Yeah, yeah. And so this, uh, some might listen to what we're saying and say, oh, that's pseudoscience. And we say, just listen to the damn episode. Yeah, I say, oh, it's pseudoscience. No, that's your gut controlling your brain. <laughs> yeah. that, that is society trying to uh, hide you from the truth. But to be serious for a second, there's two topics in this podcast, yes. which is very cool. One, we talked to Gabrielle Fondero, who, interesting enough, you're the one that tell, told me how to pronounce her name properly. Yep. And so I just kept saying it the way you told me, and then yep. you kept doing variations. You're like, it's pronounced homage. So anyway, <laughs> our homage to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just for the record, Omar. Uh, we have two topics. So one, she has her uh, degree. She studied the gut microbiome, uh, which is an area that is rife with pseudoscience. Yes. But then we explore why uh, the fringe of our understanding are breeding grounds for pseudoscience. So it's both exploring our guts, but then talking about the topic of how to differentiate from pseudoscience or why it occurs in the fringe areas of science. Yeah, and she did a great job tackling both. She's a true professional, and yeah. she explicitly states she is rather than the word expert, which you'll, you'll hear when we talk about it. And it was really cool to have her on. I love the way she thinks, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy this episode. Yeah, so without further ado, this is the episode all about your gut microbiome and also pseudoscience on the fringes of science. New environment. It's a brave new world. We salute you, Aldous Huxley. We're joined uh, with my co-host, Eric Helms, and a special guest today, Gabrielle Fundero, um, who will be talking to us about gut health. She's also jacked, and we don't want to do a pose down. If you guys don't have a video, you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, just know that it's debatable as to who is more jacked, her or Eric. I'm saying that because Eric is my co-host. The answer's obvious. It's her. Um, we have a very exciting episode talking all about gut health and then the frontiers of science being the breeding ground of pseudoscience. And we see this all too often where there are new claims constantly about either a magic pill, a quick fix, or once again, a new area that seemingly has all the answers. So we want to explore that. Um, I do have an opening question, however, for Gabrielle before I go on. Uh, Coach, what were you eating before we began the podcast? Uh, I was eating a, uh, a rich diet of vegetables, moderate lean m- amounts of protein. Okay, I had a Quest bar. <laughs> I had a Quest bar. Okay. And what what are your opinions, both of you, on Quest bars? We're not endorsed. We don't, we're not beholden to anyone. Okay. Uh, I'll give you my, my I've got a very uh, nuanced opinion. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. I second that opinion in most cases, although I have to say that the recent releases have been leaving something to be desired. Wow. Um, the, the donut was just disappointing. So okay. uh, I don't really do dairy very well, so I just really don't even deal with dairy at all. Um, and then it has plenty of sugar alcohols. Some people can handle those, but like in most cases, it's just going to be a one-way ticket to poopy town. So, so. how about uh, how do you feel about Halo Top? Also, um, a gut explosion. <laughs> it's it's combo lots of dairy and lots of erythritol, and um, it's not even worth it to me to eat like even a small a- amount of it. It's just gonna <laughs> cause a lot of issues and. Yeah, the taste is not worth the experience like 30 minutes later. So there are some days, not all days, <laughs> uh, where I might have two Quest Bars oh. and then a Halo Top mm-hmm. at night. Um, and I, I will say that I, my threshold for Quest Bars is two to where it seems to have a beneficial outcome mm-hmm. as far as, or outcomes. 
Yes. Reg- it has t- multiple beneficial regular outcomes. Okay. Yeah. A lot of poop. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. No, gotcha. no. We're being subtle, Omar. <laughs> nope. Nope. Got to spell However, out to the people. My my halo top threshold is if I do not have the quest bars, and if I don't have any other erythritol in the day, I can have three quarters of a halo top, which is physically impossible because then you're like, it's only, I mean, that's like 80 <laughs> calories. Why would I just eat it? And what's what's a little overly soft outcomes for for between, you know, like, who? yeah, it's, it's worth it. It's fine. And then I, there's some point the next day where I'm like, it wasn't worth it, but mm. then I do it again. Yeah. I feel like the overly soft outcomes aren't as bad as like just the accumulation of everything that would also come out with those, but it just hangs out. And so you just sort of inflate like the blueberry girl from Willy Wonka. That I don't have an issue with. Fortunately. Oh, yeah. For me, it just, yeah. everything is like, it's, it's, it, it, it makes sure that we have all the necessary outcomes mm-hmm. in an expedient fashion. Yeah. You know, Halo Top actually has like um, a creamery like that yep. is I think it's in California or something. So you can get like soft serve Halo Top. Um, so then it would just basically like go out and same in the in, same. Same yeah, out. Yeah. I think wow. I think that that's how you know a food is functional. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. How to define that's how you know it. it's a superfood. Yeah. Like c- corn goes out the same way it came yep. in. Yeah. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, and obviously if, uh, corn is great. So if Halo Top was a lifter, it'd be Brett Gibbs, very efficient. Okay, I understand what we're saying yeah. here now. No, you could, yeah, I, I have thrown <laughs> acid on him. He doesn't digest. That guy's <laughs> yeah, a, a, a brick shit house. Um, yeah. So speaking of shout our, out Brett Gibbs, if you're watching, I know you're not, but he's not, I'll be yeah. seeing you. Well, in, Brett, we uh, just want to thank conference. you, man. You're an OG listener of Iron Culture. Been there from the word <laughs> jump. I mean, he's never left a comment or never said anything about the podcast. But you know when a homie's just got your back, Eric. You feel it. We I feel. Fe- it. I feel him logged on. Yeah. Even though we're not online, it nope. isn't live or anything. No, but it's a spiritual connection. We're very big on the secret. Um, I'm glad. Gabrielle, you brought it up because I didn't want to sound like a quack when I said that in 2015, I had not eaten a lot of Quest Bars. I was hanging out with a homie who the alias will use. His name rhymes with Dark Hell. Um, And we were, you know, just (laughs) hanging out, lifting. It was a great time, honestly. And he was a big proponent of, you know, kind of eating on the go, which I understand. We had some monster energy, energy drinks and we had multiple Quest Bars. And I ended up having going from zero quest bars to about three, maybe four in a day and two monsters, which is completely foreign to me. And Ooh. in a period of two days, I became, not to be too explicit, so backed up um, that I ended up being constipated for four days. And then I shortly thereafter fell sick. And I'm not, this is not a drill. And ever since then, the taste <laughs> of quest bars have been etched into my brain with that hell. So I want to know what happened to me. What did they do? And why did I feel like I visited Area 51? (laughs) First, as a side commentary before we get an actual real answer on that, I love that Mm. if you get normal people our age together, they have stories like that about drinking (laughs) and what they went through. For us, they're about the effects of different diet foods. Mm -hmm. Now carry on. (laughs) I I have to add on to that. I've noticed, so as we've been touring around um, Australia, Mm -hmm. you know, we've been getting together with different groups from all the gyms and whatnot. And like, we don't go out and get alcohol. We all go out and get like various flavors of like Coke Zero and Pepsi Max and sit around (laughs) and drink those. Wild and crazy times in Melbourne. Always a fun time. Yeah, it's a different life. Um, But yeah, so... (laughs) So as far as your question, um, well, it was probably a combo of, I think those, they, so the old, the old quest bars used to have a different fiber in them. I think they've switched over to like some corn, some soluble corn fiber or something. I want to say that back in the day they had like more inulin, um, chicory root. Yeah. Mm Um, so that is a hugely fermentable fiber. And then you add the erythritol onto that. So that's a sugar alcohol also so fermentable. So the fiber, um, so the bacteria rather will ferment them to either short chain fatty acids or gases. Yep. And um, depending on the type of gas that you're building up, if you've got a little bit more methane or a little bit more hydrogen, that can actually impede motility. Yep. So basically kind of um, stops things from moving along as they should. And, um, you know, just 
fiber does have sort of a, uh, an inverse U in terms of efficacy. So like not enough, you can be constipated and too much, you can also be constipated. So you probably had like a little one, two punch there of like too much fiber, too many sugar alcohols, all of the gas. And then your body just like, it was, it reached max capacity and it was just like hard reset. Yeah. Yeah. I was, mm -hmm. uh, your gut got the blue screen of death. It did. Yes. I can't look at quest bar and the eyes again. Um, so I just, I, I want to thank you for explaining that traumatic event. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little concerned that your quest bar had eyes. I'm not sure. Did you get that in South America or was well, that? Uh, it, it sh uh, I follow the Shinto belief that everything has a spirit. So by eyes, I meant I was peering into its soul. Uh, sorry. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm being pedantic. No. Um, should, should we perhaps maybe introduce this person who's been on our podcast talking to us for like 20 minutes now about gut health? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's, it, look, so once again, for those that aren't aware, that's our attempt to have banter, which shows a sense of closeness and camaraderie that lets you know that I this podcast I don't want to fake feelings. I'm one week out, Omar. All I feel <laughs> is efficiency and leanness. Ooh. I'm an input-output oh, machine. Push. He threw it <laughs> yeah. in there, my man. I brought it. I brought it for you. High throughput. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, coach, give the uh, proper intro of who the very jacked individual, very knowledgeable individual next to you is. Yeah. So, so Gabby's a woman after my own heart because she is intellectually and educationally and physically invested in the iron mm -hmm. is how I would put that. And she nodded. So that means that my speaking for her and what, <laughs> what her values are after meeting her today <laughs> is accurate. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing that with people. That's how you should interact with others. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but in all seriousness, so we are at the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference. We're back in our lovely Bella Service Departments. Shout out JPS for the great accommodations. Um, and also shout out to Danny Lennon for letting me borrow his uh, technical gear so I can do this podcast, just showing you how professional Iron Culture is that we basically bum off <laughs> other podcasts to get our job done. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so as if we, we thought it was a great opportunity with all the experts who are out here. Um, so this is, like I said, Dr. Uh, Gabriel, and I said Fundaro, I didn't pronounce your last name right. <laughs> listen, listen to how Omar said it, that's right. Um, but yeah, so she, she is a, uh, would you say a nutritional and gut health expert? Or would you say that's kind of where you've, you've gone to, but your education was probably not in that exact direction? Um, I actually shy away from saying expert uh, just because it's a term that's used so often by so many people um, and sort of has become, I think, a little bit bastardized, especially in this area. Um, one one term that I had a, a couple ki a couple kids, um, they're young people, younger than I, who, who have kids. a podcast. Yeah, yeah some kids. Um, but they're, they're great. And they called me... Um, I, a gut health professional. And I was like, oh, I like that. I like that a lot. So I think uh, gut health professional would probably be uh, the term that I can that I can borrow or gut science professional or gut science communicator. I, I know. I think I think a, 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 pro, a gut pro professional uh, or like a gut health pro is like I'm working on getting my WNBF pro card. <laughs> you already have your gut health pro card, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that that was a pretty shitty transition to saying you also are a competitive physique athlete and power lifter. Yeah. So I um, I had a short stint in women's physique in 2015, and that show went really well for me. Um, it was, you know, the first time I'd ever gone in that direction. I actually had been um, an endurance athlete for years before that. I used to live in Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and so I was really big on trail running and hiking and uh, a little bit of mountain biking thrown in there. Um, I did a lot of rock climbing. And then um, when I started teaching, I was like, oh, you know, I want to get back into lifting. So it's what I'd been doing when I was in undergrad. Um, and so, yeah, I just thought, hey, what better way than to, you know, to develop an eating disorder and hey, <laughs> get on board yeah, with the yeah. train. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was in 2015. Um, and then I think as is the case with a lot of people after their first show, especially if they, um, are not, um, working with a coach who does a great job of preparing them yeah. after the show, it was really difficult to transition back into normal life yep. and, um, switching over to powerlifting was really a way for me to kind of release myself from the, the tight grip of all of the orthorexia and the body dysmorphia, um, 
And yeah, man, I, I competed, I think four, four times, five times in a little over a year, which is probably too much. But like when I want to do something, I want to do it all the way. Yep. And, um, I would say that those, the, the meets went really well. I actually performed better than I had anticipated. Um, despite trying to, you know, be at the, I, I was, I competed at 63 for a while, yep. cut down to 57, um, absolutely tanked that meet and then realized, you know, there's probably more to this than just trying to be like the smallest person possible lifting the most weight and so tried to you know um just live what i one of the lessons that i try to imbue in other people that you know you can still accept yourself and want to you know meet goals and change your body but it has to come from like a really positive place love it you know not it, it's um it, actually dr mike and i have talked about this and and he used a great analogy that if you were trying to change your body out of fear or out of disdain for it that it's like running away from something that you're trying to escape and the farther away you are from that thing the slower you'll go so yeah. if people are trying to change their bodies from a really negative standpoint the closer they are to their goal the more they may relax and then their adherence falls and things like that whereas if you are striving towards something that's really positive then you will actually kind of pick up momentum as you go so um yeah, my last meet, I was like, oh, I'm going to mass instead. And I had like one of the <laughs> one of the best meets that I've ever had. And um, then after that, I was like, oh, I'm going to be traveling all the time for the next several months. And so now I'm um, just kind of maintaining, which is also another thing that people should probably be really good at practicing. Yes. Yeah, the, un the undervalued uh, idea of, of making it a lifestyle and we're also goal oriented and progress yes. focused. Yeah, I, I love it. So so we're going to do some some just hot, quick stats for someone who's in academia, athlete, and also, you know, educator practitioner. So first, best total. What are your, what are your best lifts? Uh, 175 bench, 240 squat, 305 deadlift. That was a 63. 63. That's pretty damn impressive. My bench is my favorite. Everything else is like, eh. <laughs> my bench always carried me. Awesome. Now we're going to go academic stats. Yeah. Bachelor's and and through through your through through your graduate degrees what are your degrees in and what did you study yeah so um i went to school i got both my degrees in virginia um i got my bachelor's in exercise sport and health ed from radford university which at the time was really really small but it has absolutely exploded i think it's got we had maybe 6,000 students at the time and now there's well over 10,000 students wow. so that was like a bajillion years ago uh, and then I hopped over next door to Virginia Tech and that's where I got my PhD um, and it was technically in skeletal muscle physiology and biochemistry but the actual project that I was on for my dissertation um, was the first in the lab that had looked at the gut microbiome so um, we actually were looking at the potential protective role of probiotics against metabolic dysregulation induced by a high fat diet uh, and spoiler alert probiotics are not going to protect you from eating a uh, you know thousand calorie surplus and um 40 percent of your calories from fat 50 percent of which is from saturated fat so damn it just went, <laughs> i know i know we brought you Bummer. on looking for that one weird trick but uh we're still holding yeah. out here <laughs> yeah probiotics are we'll not it. we'll find it <laughs> it's probably kimchi <laughs> Awesome. And, and I think that's just actually a cool thing just for anyone who is in school, just to the, the stark contrast between undergrad being I'm studying these things to graduate school being I'm contributing knowledge. Yeah, you might have a PhD in, uh, you said sport, phys exercise physiology, skeletal muscle physiology and biochemistry. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. But what you actually ended up researching and studying and probably becoming a not an expert, but a professional in was more related to gut health. And it's the same kind of thing. Like my, my master's was in sport and exercise but I spent the entire time working with protein. So I, when, when people ask, cause it's an M Phil, I say, you know, I have a master's in sports nutrition cause that's more or less what I did. So anyway, that's just a, a fun aside. Um, so you are now a part of Renaissance periodization. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've stepped away from the ivory tower yes. where we're smarter than everyone else, <laughs> uh, where we hold the keys to success and knowledge mm -hmm. and we hold back the secrets to now joining <laughs> the, the dark tower. The Dark yes. Tower, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're with Mike Isertel, aka Sauron, um, <laughs> and uh, and now you have uh, you're, you're you're one of the rings, but you're ruled by the one ring to rule them all, which is right. Nick Shaw. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, of Renaissance Periodization, and what has that transition been like to go from being in academia to now being 
what well, I guess what would you say your role is? Um, well, it's so. Uh, what is my role in Renaissance periodization? What's the meaning of life? <laughs> We're just asking this the basic questions complex... here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, you know, what's the meaning of lift, right, Omar? <laughs> what's the meaning of lift? <laughs> Am I right? What? I uh, man, you're cutting out, Eric. It's so oh, weird. Oh, not going to even acknowledge it. He just can't handle the level <laughs> oh, of humor. Oh man. At. <laughs> um, so my title in uh, as, as part of Renaissance periodization is that I'm a nutrition coach, um, but and so I kind of a step down. Yeah. Really, so yeah. well, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so I do a lot of that, um, but there are uh, not all of the coaches in RP travel as much. Um, so there's a few of us that really do. Um, can I name names? You yeah. can name all the names you want as long as they're fine with being named to our. <laughs> Tens of subscribers, <laughs> just like okay. Brett yeah. Gibbs. Like, of course, we could shout out our. Yeah, Brett, Brett Gibbs is going to know everything. You're oh, okay, say. okay. Yeah. So, like, Lyle McDonald thinks that we have like a tour, like a black. I don't know. It's like a black market tour ring. You know, like we are part of the elite. Mm -hmm. Like that tour the world and make buku bucks. Like we are just raking in the cash oh, yeah. and like you know big time. Yeah, and like flying we, economy. <laughs> yes, yeah, like we fly business class and we go on yachts and stuff like that. Like it's this really glamorous lifestyle. Um, so it's it's super super fun, but it's obviously not that. It's you know? fitness conferences. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's amazing to go around the world. I mean, most people will never have the chance to do, um, you know, what I'm able to do uh, for a living. Living. Um, but it's just really funny that it's like, yeah, I've been living out of a bag for two and a half mm -hmm. weeks and like I've been wearing pretty much the same clothing on repeat and, you know, you've got to like, you know, buy a little um, travel size of everything and uh, yeah, it's just it's you don't get a lot of sleep. So it's so funny that people think that. But um, yeah, that's part that's really what I've started to do more of in the past year. Um, the first year that I was with RP, I was still teaching. So I was teaching full time. I had a really small client load and it was my sort of my my side gig. But it was so fulfilling because, as I'm sure, you know, anyone who's listening, um, who's been in academia knows that sometimes that can be kind of thankless, um, especially depending on, you know, the the group that you're working with and sort of the culture and the climate wherever you are. And I like to talk about, you know, big picture topics and a lot of application and, and complex things and a lot of nuance. And um, some students don't really want to hear that. They kind of want to, like, you know, give me the PowerPoint slides, tell me what I need to know so I can reiterate that on the test. Working with undergrads mostly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was 100 percent undergrads. I wasn't able to do really any research there. And um, I was sort of getting burnt out uh towards the end of it and so for that last year i was like i don't know really what i'm gonna do from here but i'm gonna save up as much money as i can so i can just do something <laughs> so uh then after a year of doing both i was able to then leave academia um and you know enter the world of entrepreneurialism which is super freaking scary because it's like you now have you, you everything is your responsibility and like if the shit hits the fan what are you gonna do and you know so it was uh it was pretty overwhelming at first and uh you know i just made sure i had all my ducks in a row and wow it was actually super easy like the transition was just uh, i can work from home which is pretty cool you can like be in your pajamas um making like definitely way more money than i w could have in academia and far 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 more importantly um working with people who are really not only receptive to the information but desirous of it seeking it out yes yeah. like now you know it, i'm giving it's so funny i've given um talks about gut health and sport nutrition and some of the things I've, I've taught in the past. And it was like, I taught this the same way that I'm speaking about it now, but no one gave a crap when yeah. I was teaching it. People care and want to interact with you. And, you know, there's such a connection and an exchange of ideas. And then coming to the conferences and being able to interact with other people who are so intellectually curious. It's just another level of fulfillment. I mean, th I don't I don't think that there's anything that I could be doing right now that would make me any happier than what I'm doing that's that's really cool to hear what you know the the, uh, the cool thing for me to listen to you talk about that is that you have very similar experience to what I've had except I just did the reverse order to where <laughs> I started as a personal trainer mm -hmm. and then got eventually into academia yeah and have been able to kind of see oh hold on 
I don't want to put my foot in too deep into academia and I'm keeping a part-time role only doing what I feel gives me that fulfillment mm -hmm. in the right environment and culture. I'm very fortunate at AUT only working with those really motivated masters and PhD yes. students guest lecturing at certain courses. And I think I just, I really relate to what you're saying, but almost just coming at it from the, the other angle and still getting to the same place. So I think I just respect the hell out of you. You did a great job presenting. Um, and I think you're a much needed voice uh, and you add a lot. And I'm very also thankful for Renaissance Periodization. They do a lot of contributing to the body of knowledge. People don't know this. They don't advertise it that much, uh, but they contribute to, I'd say, maybe six or seven different research groups that I'm aware of uh, globally that are doing sports science in some way that affects lifting culture. Um, and yeah, we're not talking $50 million grants, but sports science isn't expensive. And even a two, three, four, five grand grant is the difference between having the funding to do a PhD or not in sports science. Yeah. So anyway, just wanted to say thanks, and thanks to you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And uh, now that we have a, uh, a gut health professional <laughs> on the podcast, I think while I do want to talk about gut health, because I think it's interesting, and there is the reason why it's, I, I think, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, taken kind of the blogosphere by storm in the nutritional world, is because there is some cool stuff coming out of there that surprised a lot of people. Yeah. And it's a lot more complex than we might have realized. But that's also, uh, no pun intended since we're talking about bacteria, the breeding ground for pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. Typically on, and this is something you see in almost all fields, the, like the bleeding edge of what we know is the, 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 the primary place that people sit who sell you bullshit. Oh, yeah. And so w what is that like for you as someone who's a, who's a legitimate professional in this area who is constantly sharing space with people who are basically just making people, ma making shit up that can actually hurt you and making money off it? Yeah. Oh man. It's so frustrating. And it, <laughs> I don't mean to be elitist and I try to dark tower. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Would that make me Saruman? Actually, that's, 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 that's the, isn't that the white hand I think is Saruman. Uh, yeah. so, uh, Saruman is, does work in, in conjunction with Sauron. Um, yeah. eventually, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually. Yeah. He, he is one of the Maiar that is actually yep. him Gandalf. Uh, the two that went east were Gandalf, goes Radagast, and then Radagast, the brown, um, yep. the the blue, and then the red. Yeah, no, he is of the Meyer, but he's fallen. He was the leader, and that's why Gandalf comes back as the white. Yeah, no, I uh, Silmarillion's my jam. Anyways, Melkor <laughs> is the real Dark Lord. If we're Sauron yeah. was actually just Sauron's Sauron, actually, lightweight. Was that lightweight? Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So you want to just talk about Lord of the Rings? Uh, yeah, so I don't want to be an elitist. <laughs> but <orcs>. um, but, <laughs> but it is frustrating to see that um, social media has been sort of an equalizer in terms of making everyone's voice um, the same volume. Mm. And so people think that everyone's opinion is equally val valid. And um, I'm sure that people have good intentions, but that doesn't make up for bad science right and so it's frustrating when i have to sort of provide extra justification and extra evidence against a pseudoscientific claim only because that person may have heard the pseudoscientific claim first so yeah. there's that first exposure bias and now i have to try and like prove that person wrong or it's like one of the memes that i have shared that i love is like do you ever have it's something like do you ever have that moment where someone has said something so wrong but you like can't really take the time to correct them because you would have to invest in like an entire undergraduate career just to get them to the place where like they would understand what you're trying to say they're that far down the rabbit hole yes. that you would need like a rocket ship to get out of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's almost sometimes insurmountable. So I try to just choose my battles widely, wisely mm -hmm. and and just put out good content. And, I, you know, people will sort of self-select to what I'm putting out. And so that's great. You know, I'm kind of like developing that niche. Yeah. Um, but what what really gets me is that people are doing actual harm yes to to clients and i'm seeing it firsthand because i quite often um work with clients who've already been to another practitioner and spent hundreds or thousands of dollars on just useless tests now they have severe orthorexia their symptoms aren't any better um and you know i always will defer first to like visiting gastroenterologist or a gp and then once that's good then it's like okay now let's look at what you've tried and it's just like complete nonsense from some sort of functional medicine practitioner 
practitioner or something. You know, they're doing these cleanses and detoxes. And so, um, I, and then I start to wonder like, okay, how good are those intentions really? Like, you know, we're not, no one is completely altruistic. We can't do this for free, but there's a, a fine line between, you know, supporting yourself and then taking advantage of people by trying to trick them into thinking that they're broken in some way so that you can sell them whatever is going to fix them. Yeah, you do have to, qu like, I 100% I believe that most of the stuff that we assume, I'm, I'm going to speak broadly as a community, not as we, anyone here, but as the fitness kind of evidence-based community, when we're, when we vilify someone, I do think probably eight out of the 10 times, it's actually just someone uninformed who's not intending mm -hmm. malintent, yeah. which is kind of scary when you think about it, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. Um, but there is definitely that two out of 10. And you can tell when, when the message is, let me tell you how you're broken that you didn't even know about it. Not I'm here to help someone when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's a one big one to watch out for as an audience member. Yeah. When you're co when you think everything's fine and your coach now convinces you you're broken and then there's, and then there's an aha sell afterwards when the punch comes afterwards and it's expensive and they're lining their pockets and you didn't know there's a problem until he told you probably not a good guy or gal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, so let's, let's, let's just start Omar. What, what do you think about like, what is gut health? People say that a lot. I'm well, sure people, uh, uh, Eric, yeah. like uh, you, you, you're an equal expert here because I, I know you, you have a YouTube channel. Uh, so yeah. what's gut health, Omar, well, now Eric, that we've got I'm, an expert yeah. like yourself I'm on the I'm glad you the brought podcast. that up. Uh, equal expert because I don't know if you know this, Gabrielle. I own a small kombucha farm um, <laughs> where I harvest uh, it's it's handcrafted, it's artisanal. Uh, ar ar artisanal. Arte artisanal. Uh, <laughs> artisanal. Yeah. Artisanal. Um, and what it is, is we just, uh, we pack in a whole bunch of good stuff in there that we don't want to make, stuff. uh, false claims or anything like that, but we have cured cancer. And, uh, mm -hmm. so I'm just curious. <laughs> I, I want to take, I take issue with some of the things you say, because I think you just haven't tried out like kombucha. Um, maybe you've had the wrong kimchi and, uh, you know, there's just Bit of an echo chamber maybe with the academia that she's mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Yeah. I just, so I guess. If I want to be convinced, and uh, it's your opinion we're talking about here, um, maybe describe to us what gut health is exactly. Like, what is this entire field that you studied? Um, what is its role? What are some common misconceptions? And let's go from there, and uh, I'll see. Okay, great. So fortunately for everyone listening, I can actually cure dysbiosis and define exact gut health and i have one crazy supplement that you might not have heard about yet this is what we were waiting for yeah yeah this is what the one trick doctors don't want you to know that's what doctors want mm. you to not get help not know <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i'm funded by big fiber mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, okay, so in um, in all seriousness, we actually don't have a profile for um, a healthy gut. The characteristic of a healthy gut would just be that when we're looking at the organisms present, that we have a large diversity of organisms. So we have a lot of species there that they are represented in such a way that the potential pathogens, their, their proliferation is suppressed. Not that we have zero, it's just that they don't get out of hand. Um, and that we have a kind of distant uh, relatedness. And that means that we are going to have a, a diverse um, array of genes as well so not just who's there but we have what can they do so they serve a lot of different functions and they really um fill specific niches like metabolic deficiencies that uh that or digestive deficiencies that we have so there are uh about 17 enzymes that we produce um for uh various carbohydrate digestion um and they have hundreds so we've outsourced that to them they take care of those uh fibers those indigestible fibers so we don't have to um, and so that's like as close as we can get to gut health, but there are some theories that, you know, even our healthy, so our healthy controls from around the world look significantly different. And there's sort of a theory that, especially in Westernized cultures, what we consider to be a healthy control may still be a little bit dysbiotic just because we are kind of chronically deficient in fiber and we don't eat a great diet. Gabriel, so it define may, dysbiotic. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So, <laughs> gotcha. So dis- <laughs> We're on the same page, brother. Yes. So dysbiosis is, a, again, sort of an amorphous term because we don't have one specific profile of Can dysbiosis. Can you define amorphous? amorphous? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. We're good. Um, uh, but it's just a, an unfavorable relative abundance of species. So that means that we probably have too few of what we consider to be beneficial and or too many of what we consider to be pathogenic. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, pathogenic microbes are they're they they're constantly keeping um, count of their numbers. They do something called quorum sensing, so they're kind of counting how many of my of other strains just like me are out there, and they aren't going to actually start to produce virulence factors and cause disease until there's a sufficient number of them. So if someone goes and has a you know some sort of test done on their fecal sample and is they identify a pathogenic strain or two, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the midst of an infection. It's just present, but you're not able to actually quantify how many are in there. That's what matters. And then let's uh, get into some words that we hear about uh, on the outside in the kombucha world is uh, (laughs) pre and probiotics, uh, Mm -hmm. how people talk a lot about those. You said the gut health, the body naturally produces, you said 17 enzymes. Um, Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. For carbohydrate digestion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're keto warriors. So that's why I was just curious why we brought that up. We don't need (laughs) any of those. We don't need any of them. We're that efficient. Um, But okay. So then uh, you discuss uh, you uh discuss the enzymes what are pre and probiotics and how then does gut health work overall where people are trying to balance either those enzymes you hear mm. about that in the news or individuals are trying to have a more favorable uh gut health outcome yeah so um probiotics the the definition for those have changed has changed a little bit in recent years it used to be um live beneficial microorganisms now they don't necessarily have to be alive but they're still microorganisms that we ingest to exert favorable effects on the host um it could be bacteria but there are uh yeast versions of probiotics as well um and like i said some of them are not alive so the new big thing now is that we have spore forming uh probiotics so they're not alive but they form spores which are sort of like latent um uh forms of bacteria that will then give rise you know theoretically in the gut Um, And then a prebiotic is a uh, fiber or a carbohydrate that would feed those bacteria. Mm. So we don't have to, so you can supplement either one of those, but you wouldn't necessarily have to. So some cultured foods do contain what would be considered probiotic strains of bacteria. And then um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, anything that contains soluble fiber or resistant starch. Those are all examples of prebiotics. So they're just prebiotic um, naturally occurring in the food. So you don't have to supplement those in your diet. Uh, And I think it's ideal probably not to. Um, There are definitely uh, benefits to certain probiotics in specific disease states, but there's not like a kitchen sink. I've even seen the term broad spectrum probiotic. I think they're like borrowing from broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, and that really just doesn't exist. There are, they're very strain specific to the point that some strains are even only effective so far in pediatrics. Got it. So it's like, you can't say that, yo, this one crazy trick is going to work for everyone, you know? Um, and, and then there's also some evidence that perhaps it's not ideal to take probiotics because in some cases they can actually interact with drugs or delay reestablishment of your uh, native microbiome like after a course of antibiotics. So it's definitely something that needs to be taken with care. Okay. Okay. So the fact that my poop screen's no big deal. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, that's what I got from that. That's what I got out of that. Now, I, I do want to know uh, then where you mentioned specifically, I think, here in the West, how... Uh, uh, what is it, the foods that we eat, where you said it's not an ideal uh, gut health scenario. Um, mm-hmm. First question is, why do you hate the West? And then second question is, how does that come about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Capitalism. <laughs> that was not convincing. Um, no, yeah, I'm kidding. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't buy that. No, you, no. You need to have a little more. You need to sell that more, unironically. Oh. Okay, yeah. okay. I can't make that claim, though, because, like, I, like, I, I just love Australia, so that counts, right? We eat a westernized diet out here. Yeah, it's upside down America. We'll yeah, take it. Yeah, we'll take exactly. It. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. I uh I like want to relocate out here. It's like America plus. It's America almost as good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric, for defending the free nation. 
I know. It says, it says the Canadian living, talking to the guy with permanent residency in New Zealand who's yeah. in Australia right now. Yeah, we're all we're all expats. Uh-huh. Of, yeah, various degrees Traitors. of, of, of traitorism. <laughs> We're just so we're on, yeah, I, I don't I guess, remember uh, the second question. We're, we're on what I guess you call permanent vacation. Um, <laughs> that's right. So uh, the question is, you mentioned the Western diet uh, mm-hmm. specifically not being ideal. Have they also studied other diets or uh, it, we're talking now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is pretty cool. So they've actually, even in the U.S., they've actually looked at more rural diets. Um, and rural doesn't mean like Macca's slash McDonald's. It's just kind of a higher fiber, um, uh, less refined grains, um, You usually uh, higher in um, what we consider to be, you know, like healthy fats or slash lower in saturated fats and especially in developing areas of the world. So when we look at places like West Africa um, or places in South America where they're eating a very uh, agrarian diet. So it's grown next to their home. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So it's very high in fiber, high in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, um, and then very low in processed meats and overall just a less processed diet. Diet. That seems to correlate with more microbial diversity and um, sort of specifically what we would consider to be an enterotype, sort of like somatotypes like ectomezo and endomorph, except for those are bullshit. Um, <laughs> the enterotypes. Well, I will actually say they're not bullshit. It's what people do with them that's bullshit. Oh, yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Wow. Um, but it's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an, I'm, I'm an as, ISAC level one anthropometrist. Yeah, as, as someone that self-identifies as a mesomorph, I thought that was important for you to speak <laughs> of. Correct, yeah. Um, so they, we have enterotypes. So we have sort of a more carbohydrate metabolizing enterotype, and then we have more bacteria, uh, excuse me, uh, protein metabolizing enterotype. And what we find in westernized diets is usually because they are high in refined carbohydrates, low in fiber, um, usually higher in fats, higher in saturated fats, higher in processed meats, um, that individuals eating a more westernized type diet tend to have the more bacteroides, um, or, excuse me, protein. I don't want to use the, the words and get too like complex. Oh, we'll too just ask you to okay, anyway. okay. Don't worry. We'll take you out that dark tower every time. All right. So they usually are having uh, higher levels of the um, uh, protein metabolizing enterotype. That's, that's, that's good. And... Uh, it's kind of bad, actually. It can well. It, it's in context. In context. So some of the bacteria, if they're like starved of fiber, will potentially turn on the mucus layer of your intestines and start to degrade that. Which is good because mucus is gross. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we, yeah. we don't want mucus, but it's also kind of bad because it. we want like we have a super super thick mucus layer in our colon, as sexy as that sounds. Um, so we kind of want that to be really thick and impenetrable to bacteria. Um, and so if we start to degrade it because some you know bacteria will will use the carbohydrates that are there instead of the dietary carbohydrates. So you know, and that could pot- potentially we we see changes with like a ketogenic diet, um, almost certainly with a carnivore. diet diet, which is probably like the biggest thorn in my side. I try not to be dogmatic about things, but I cannot think of like a dumber way to eat. You know, on on that, I think this would be a really good tangent. We had, um, so we had Danny Lennon and uh, my colleague Cliff Harvey, who Mm -hmm. who was actually a ketogenic diet researcher finishing his PhD at AUT. Yeah. And they were talking about how like the carnivore diet is, they finally did the one thing that, that everyone agrees on and tried to throw out the window. Yeah. You know, like everyone agrees, no matter which camp you were in, at least five years ago, that vegetables are great. Mm-hmm. And then I knew as soon as vegan went hard, that just the natural cyclical nature of the fitness industry, someone would be like, well, fuck it, all meat, I don't care. And then it would go from being, you know, maybe not too, so serious to a global movement. But I can't remember if it was Cliff or if it was Danny. I think it might have been Danny what? who said it actually makes sense that a lot of people are reporting better gut health from being Cliff. on a carnivore diet. Because it's not just a low... It's not a low FODMAP diet. It's zero no. FODMAP. It's a new, so at least yeah. in, in, and it's almost one of these things that it's, we were talking about this not too long ago on the, uh, the science communication, uh, or evidence-based one with, uh, with Brad Dieter and, um, Andy Galpin. as well as Andy Galpin, how people have gotten to this point where if they can't tangibly see it and directly in front of them, because there's so much, like there's such a fire hose and many, like the whole flat earth thing. Yeah. There's so much information out there. I can't, I can't trust anything. Look, if, if I can't touch it, hold it, see it, it's not real. Mm-hmm. So this concept of, you know, if you eat, if you have a whole healthy lifestyle, you're going to live longer and feel better. It gets trumped by the idea of, I felt better 
in one day from eating just yes. meat. Yeah. And they stay there without realizing that there's just a preponderance of data showing that eating a lot of vegetables is good for almost every health and performance outcome mm-hmm. you can imagine mm-hmm. in the long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They and, and I see so many people that equate gut health with pooping or like that's why halo or top not is so pooping. good for your gut <laughs> exactly yeah so they'll say you know in a lot of cases oh you know i was bloated and i was gassy and now i'm not and now um you know i have far fewer bowel movements and you know they're smaller they're easy to pass and so that must mean that everything is hunky dory in there and that's not actually the case like your poop quality can be a surrogate for what might be going on in there but just to say that oh i'm not gassy and bloated today that means that everything's great that doesn't necessarily mean that everything's great you have literally no way of of seeing what's going on which is the problem don't you think good poops are a nice trade-off for colorectal cancer Mm, I, know, I feel like that's that that's something that each person should decide for themselves. one wipe so one wipe uh-huh. coach yeah exactly one wipe and you're done save on toilet paper one wipe and a little chemo Mm -hmm. i'm fine with that you know i actually was on a podcast that was please don't mention another podcast when you're on our podcast because it it makes us feel like we're not providing what you want apparently this is an open relationship (laughs) this is podcast inception because i was on another podcast talking about another podcast (laughs) i was specifically on that podcast to debunk you realize right now you are on a podcast podcast. yes talking about being on a podcast about being a podcast but i digress but um the the practitioner that i had sort of debunked made was saying that like it's not even that big of a risk you know your relative risk is of colorectal cancer is only increased by like 17 percent um you know if you're eating more red meat and i was like (laughs) okay even if it's a small percentage increase I think as a medical professional, you probably shouldn't be recommending things okay. knowingly. So there's, 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 there's do no harm. And then there's like, do no harm <laughs> if you're paying me. And yes. I think I feel like that that's cause there, I, there's the, like, I, I know the Hippocratic oath, like I have a PhD, so I'm a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All doctors right? are pretty much the same. And I, I'm pretty sure that it's got some caveats and some some bullet points after it. Yeah, like do mostly no harm. Yeah, do less harm than something that kills you right now. Yes, yeah. exactly. But it's yep. like, like if, 17%, if, bro. So like... Yeah, yeah. it's not that... Mm. And, oh, and of a small number in the first place. Mm-hmm. So just yeah. buy my shit. Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. I, I want to give Gabrielle the opportunity because with Iron Culture, we're going to be posting soon clips, a small portion of the episode on our channel. And so this is our opportunity to elevate you uh, to that level of notoriety that uh, we want out of the people we bring on. Gotcha Journalism 101. I don't know if you know this individual. I do want to explore this, honestly, the, a, a serious question here. Uh, someone, uh, Michaela Peterson is her name. She's uh, Jordan Peterson's <sighs> daughter. Well, so here's the question, because I'm going to give her side in quotations, and then I want the scientific answer. Um, uh-huh. where she said, as I understand it, to paraphrase that herself and her father, she had numerous ailments, uh, mm-hmm. uh, diseases that any other dietary protocol that she followed, she'd get either inflammation. She wouldn't feel as good. She'd be lethargic. She's tired. She was depressed. Her father was depressed. So she tried numerous things. She went to a lot of doctors and none of the doctors had that one weird trick. They couldn't find yeah. what was wrong with her. Now she did eliminate according to her own words. She eliminated everything from her diet, talking about that low FODMAP and following a carnivore diet. And so she exclusively eats now, I believe, meat. So she's adhering to the classic carnivore diet. Uh, she also still drinks. I think she said she could handle vodka, but nothing else. So I think it's, I think it's, um, she's on the vodka meat. and steak diet. Yeah, it's vodka and steak. And then I forget the third one, uh, but it, it's essentially that. Uh, Gabrielle, is that just a, an, an insane level of self deception? Are there, outliers that for some reason with their gut health that is the thing that's most optimal for them what is going on in the case of an individual like that who is convinced that the scientific establishment one didn't have any of the answers and that two this very restrictive form of eating which on the surface for anyone that knows anything about nutrition seems woefully inadequate when it comes to micronutrients um how how does that work um now I will say that I have heard from multiple clients that it is difficult to 
sometimes get a helpful diagnosis or, or helpful information even after they visited multiple practitioners. And I think that, you know, especially in the U.S., it's partly a problem of just not having a lot of exposure in that appointment. So you may have a few minutes and it's hard for them to gather all of the data. Um, but then I think also it could be, you know, what type of practitioners are you visiting? If you're going to a lot of practitioners who are not specialized in that field, that's probably not the best choice you could have made. Now, in terms of how the diet could actually be beneficial, if you remove absolutely everything in your diet except meat, just by chance, you are almost certainly going to eliminate what Ever it was that was actually causing you issues. So she certainly, and because yes, the the microbiome is um, correlated with uh, a number of different disease states and autoimmune diseases and things like that. We know that there's a connection, but it is really just by chance that she eliminated whatever it was that was causing problems. And she can't actually say that it was all fruits and vegetables and every other thing except for meat. She just hasn't gone about the process of reintroducing anything, which is what you're really supposed to do after any elimination diet. And I think she actually does claim to like cure stuff, which is pretty problematic. Um, she now you does know. Gabrielle uh, coaching too, as I understand it. So she, her limited, what worked for her, like N equals one, her sample size, will now try and apply it to the public, as I understand it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the beauty of eliminating everything is that it eliminates everything so it's mm -hmm. it's basically you know you're, you're literally throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you know we throw a lot of babies out coach on it with this podcast mm -hmm. cause that's that's a that's a frequently used analogy of a man eric which is mm -hmm. it's one of those things like um you know people are good in spite of what they're doing rather than because of what they're doing mm, right it's Absolutely. just a, it's a happy accident. Good for her. She feels better. But um, that doesn't mean that that's the what will work for everyone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, Eric and I have been talking about a new dietary protocol that I want to run by you. And I suppose we need uh, the backing of the scientific community. It's it's debatable, but uh, I'm going to give you the I proposal. feel like I am the scientific community. Omar. Yeah. Yeah. So you already said we, so yeah, the two, science already said, yeah, you got us. So just yeah, so you know, here. science already said yes, but we want to hear with your limited scope what you think. Um, we call it, so you heard of the carnivore diet, the ketogenic diet, um, you know, the ethical practice of uh, being a vegan. Cool. Uh, we want to take it one step further, and uh, we want to be breatharians, which means essentially that we don't consume any food, any liquid. Yes. Oxygen is actually the most life-preserving, as we know, and so we're just going to adhere to that. We're going to eat absolutely nothing. And uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, the uh, ultimate elimination. Yes. Diet. Yeah. 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 Another funny story. <laughs> there is a there is a uh, computer science uh, PhD holder who has written about the dangers of glyphosate, which is found in Roundup. And and I mean, just widely conflates the data, huge extrapolations. I mean, just completely like in left field. Fear mongering. You know. Yeah, absolute fear mongering. Um, and, 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 and her articles get shared quite often. And she does do published reviews because she's a PhD holder. So I found a TEDx talk by her, just mm. random on the internet. Um, and TEDx even had a little disclaimer like, oh, we're reviewing the contents of this video and whatnot. She claims that humans can be charged by the sun, like solar panels. Not like solar panels. I mean, it actually makes total sense. We all evolved from plant life. No. So I'm still swamp thing. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, no. it was, uh, it's like, her explanation was that the red blood cells like rub up against the epithelial lining uh -huh. and then we cre it creates a charge uh -huh. and then that's just that's all we need and that's just the sun charges us it increases that which is why everyone in london is dead yes <laughs> <laughs> They're living in the underworld. We were wondering yeah. where the river Styx was, and actually it was uh, in London. And that's how I know that the Earth is actually flat, mm -hmm. because the GPS data from my phone, which is false, on Instagram tells me most of my followers are in London. Since I know that we actually get energy from the sun, there's a lot of fog in London. Therefore, everyone in London is dead. Therefore, Instagram is lying. Therefore, GPS is a lie. Therefore, Earth is flat. <laughs> I don't want to drop this mic because it's Annie Lennon's, but I would 
if it was mine. Yes, yeah. That is the logical progression of the internet. Like, mm-hmm. that's what people do. Yeah. I actually went to school with a kid who was like, hey, so if reactive oxygen species are bad, shouldn't we just avoid oxygen? Or reacting. Yes. Yeah. One of the two. How, yeah. like, I, I cannot argue with that. It's either don't breathe or be a stoic. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know which one to choose. Yes, I, but but be, as a stoic, I'm going to think about not breathing a lot. <laughs> now, so uh, I think. Yeah, go on. Oh, oh, are you Omar? Oh. You transition. Oh yeah. So here's here's a transition to the practical, useful, applicable uh, portion of the podcast. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> but we're connected in the. We might be separated by thousands of miles, but I'll never let you go. Okay. <laughs> separated by thousands of miles in a straight line. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. If I just if I just leave my house and start walking, eventually I'll find you. You, you'll drown, you but, would, you, but you would yeah. have been got it, getting here with a boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm counting on the sun giving me powers, much like how it gives, uh, you know, the son of Krypton, Superman. You know, I, I yes, don't know if you guys ever heard exactly. of a little superhero called Krypton. Anyways, um, I want the practical, applicable component where I want to talk about, because we, we've now discussed kind of the frontiers of science, pseudoscience. We've uh, discussed some charlatans that attempt to use that uh, lack of information or the fact that um, there aren't good practic- uh, practitioners like yourself on the, you know, on the front line of discussing these things. What are some big misconceptions when it comes to uh, gut health? What are things people should know? Like, what are some basic primers? Where it's like, hey, I want to sit you down. So some of the watches, the news every day at six o'clock, they've heard a few things. That's why I was throwing out prebiotic, probiotic, good, bad. Uh, for your gut. If you had to sit someone down, you're like, listen up, Skippy. I'm going to talk to you about gut health for like 10 minutes. Here's <laughs> here's some shit you need to know. Here's what's totally false. What would you tell someone just to set them straight? You know, you, you know you've you heard of the program Scared Straight, where they attempt yes. to scare uh, juvenile delinquents into, you know, adhering to the law. Same idea. Scare us straight. Yeah. Okay. You Are you guys ready to be scared? It's like Halloween right now. <laughs> There's right. there's nothing you can do and death is inevitable. So gut health doesn't matter. See, she's perfect for our culture. We we say that pretty much every episode. That's how we stay motivated. Yep. Yeah. Um all right. So it, that that's my joke. I'm like, well, we're all going to die anyway, but maybe we can just like wait a little bit longer. <laughs> Yeah, patience. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so I would say some of the big misconceptions. Um, the One of the top would be when people claim to be able to um, cure or, or will diagnose or cure either uh, dysbiosis or leaky gut. Um, so there's no, because there's no specific profile of dysbiosis and it's not technically a disease, it's not something that can be diagnosed. It's really not something that can be cured. Yes, we can maintain dietary and lifestyle habits that support a diverse microbiome, but most studies really show that these short-term interventions, whether it's a probiotic or exercise or a change in diet, um, really make very minor uh, modifications to the microbiome in the short term. And it's about what you do like over a very long, long period of time. But like majority of the microbiome really appears to be pretty stable from about puberty until old age. And there's not a lot you can do with it. So it's kind of on your, it's on your parents to set you up with something good. And so if they didn't, then uh, you're kind of screwed. Um, the other would be, and then so with leaky gut, in, increased intestinal permeability, I've seen it report that, oh, there was a change in increased intestinal permeability. So that's basically the space um, in between the intestinal cells. And we don't want a high level of intestinal permeability because that can allow for um, inflammatory compounds to leak uh, between those cells. But sometimes papers or people will say, oh, it was um, we decreased intestinal permeability. Oh, that sounds great. But when you actually look at the values, it's all within a normal range. So we don't get big aberrations in intestinal permeability unless we're looking at a person who has like like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's or colitis or something. So just normal individuals are really not going to see huge increases in that. And and the ways that we can measure that are pretty much all indirect, kind of expensive, um, and will change depending on whether we've had, you know, exercise with intensity, it can increase after a high fat meal. Um, so, and again, it's not a disease state, not something that we can diagno- diagnose and then claim to cure. Um, the other one would be sort of along the same lines, talk, people talking about rebuilding the microbiome or being able to kill off or increase the growth of specific microbes. Uh, yeast is one. Um, there are uh, the 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 
pathogenicity, the, the damage that any one microbe can do is context dependent upon the relative abundance. And they all play an important role. So we actually want even some of the pathogenic microbes and we want yeast. So we can't do a candida cleanse because A, you don't want to because you need them in there. And B, there's not a way to just get rid of one microbe. They're all interacting with each other. And the things that you might do, like not eating sugar. Okay, great. You're not having an, an additional refined sugar in your diet. That's fine. But if it goes so far that you're not eating fruits and you're not eating vegetables and you're not eating grains, well, now you're not feeding any of the bacteria, beneficial or not. So that's another huge um, uh, myth that people really uh, perpetuate. Um, and then I would also say when um, talk, using gut health as sort of a reason why we might not be able to lose weight. There is definitely, there's data, and this is in, in um, rodents and in humans, that we've been able to estimate that in some cases, individuals have a microbiome that increases energy harvesting capability from the diet. So maybe instead of eating your 200, or excuse me, instead of uh, uh, digesting and absorbing all 2,000 calories that you've counted, you may get up to 2,200 calories at the higher end. They estimate it's about 6 to 10%. So um, more of the fiber is actually converted into yes, exactly. short-chain fatty acids by the gut. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But that doesn't mean that you can't lose weight. It just means that you have to adjust your estimates, which are just estimates anyway. So yeah, maybe the person next to you can get away with a little bit more laxity in your diet and you can't. But it doesn't completely preclude you from being able to lose weight. But people will say, oh, I, I have to heal my gut before I can lose weight. Or um, I'm not I'm not like absorbing nutrients properly and that's why I can't lose weight and it's like oh man i Actually, wish i the opposite yeah, yeah yeah exactly i wish i could just not absorb my nutrients that would be awesome let me eat all of the food um and there have been cases where dysbiosis actually prevented weight gain too it can cause failure to thrive in in children in developing countries so um that's just another sort of myth that I think gut health, I, I, there was a great quote, Kevin Hall shared it from an article, and I can't remember the name of the author, but they said that um, the gut microbiome has become the new conspiracy theory. Yes. Mm. It is a scapegoat. And yeah, it. I have to say that the gut microbiome is related to arguably at every organ system in the human body there's a connection there but that doesn't mean that it is to blame for everything or that it is the solution to everything that's just sort of what it's become right now so i think those would be my my biggest yeah it, it reminds me of, of uh in the the physical therapy massage and kind of pseudo exercise world fascia Mm, yes. You know how, because it's connected to everything and because it's used and we, we, we're we learning some things about it that we didn't know before, uh, you're able to make claims that can't be disproven. Mm -hmm. And and that, that also that that's a thing. We don't want to be playing the game of whack-a-mole and myth-busting so much as evidence-based professionals that we start to talk ourselves into anything that doesn't have an evidence basis is false because mm -hmm. that's just not what science does, right? And uh, I think we've gotten into a lot of problems with that where... You know, I think there's a lot of value in what you've talked about in eating healthy, that there are issues with processed foods, that you do want to eat a lot of vegetables, where even five years ago, that would have triggered a lot of the quote unquote uh, fitness evidence-based crowd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, because no, 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 only thing that matters is macros. Yeah. You're orthorexic and you're like, no, no, I'm just saying that vegetables have healthy functions. Nope. I'm only going to drink Gatorade, take whey protein, and it doesn't make a difference, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's really illuminating. Um, Speaking of not playing whack-a-mole, you've told people what the myths are for lifters and just really anyone who wants to be healthy. What are some things that they should do to promote a an overall healthy lifestyle that includes gut health mm -hmm. uh, for their for their career? Yeah, this is probably like the most underwhelming aspect of the talk every time. I think people are waiting for me to be like, you have to eat kombucha and yogurt every day. Um, and there's just not uh, really compelling evidence. And I mean, there have been a lot of studies that have been done on, on fermented dairy. And it's just sort of like, eh. It's fine. Um, but again, it's about that habitual diet and lifestyle and that where we find the, the greatest abundance and the greatest diversity uh, of microbes are in individuals who are physically active mm. and who are also eating a plant centric diet. So I don't mean that it, it has to exclude animal products, but eating plants at every meal. And that means fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, um, not just veggies and trying to eat a wide variety of those foods 
and really only eliminating where you have a, a known either food allergy, obviously, or if you have a, a, an intolerance, meaning that you're not producing the digestive enzyme to break down the, the compounds and then uh, absorb them readily. So they're causing diarrhea and, and bloating and gas and things like that. So lactose intolerance is one that's really common. Yep. Um, but aside from that, you know, sometimes people do have issues with some of the fermentable fibers and um, a low FODMAP elimination and reintroduction process is key point reintroduction yes exactly um has actually has a, a a really a great deal of evidence to support its use for people who have irritable bowel syndrome um so not to say that you know yeah everyone should be able to eat absolutely all foods at all times of course you know we have to have an individualized approach at well as well but i think everyone should be eating a variety of plant material in, as a base to, you know, adding in their um, animal products as well. So basically the, the end of Omar's YouTube videos could sum up what you've said, yeah. which where he ends with eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your, not that we can say it on Iron Culture, vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. something that rhymes with ducking. Um, but yeah, you know, I just, I'm an OG. Thanks, Eric, for uh, giving me the nod. I appreciate that. This just in. Uh, with iron culture, eating grass is good for you, which I've I've known for a long time. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad we got to that. I do want to uh, quickly touch upon food allergies because these days um, gluten is uh, held to the same level of fear as Lord Voldemort. And uh, yes. I just mm -hmm. want to know. I can't believe you said his name. Well, he said gluten too. We're uh, I'll be dead. I'll be dead by. We got midnight. a lot of dangerous things happening here. <laughs> this is the last appearance you'll ever see of me. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I just I just put a big X on my back. Um, right now, gluten and Voldemort <laughs> are, are playing rock scissors paper with who gets to take his soul. Mm -hmm. yep. 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 So for those, because I think when Eric said uh, fear mongering by the media and by individuals that are trying to sell you then something. Um, there might be a disproportional fear out of certain things such as uh, gluten or dairy. How does one accurately determine uh, a food allergy? Like what would be the best practice then for someone trying to optimize what they eat then for their gut health? Um, well, they would definitely want to go to um, an allergist. So that person can actually do, there are a few different ways that we can test for food allergies. You can do a skin prick test for an IgE mediated food allergy. So you would have a localized reaction. Um, and that indicates that you may then have a food allergy to uh, one of the foods present and a test for a bunch of other different allergies too. Um, you could also do a, an oral tolerance test, which is really unpleasant and wouldn't usually be uh in would usually be contraindicated but in in a case where you don't have an ige mediated food allergy but you have one that could cause um what's called enterocolitis um then you would have pretty much an immediate reaction to that food in terms of vomiting diarrhea um so then you would know that you're probably allergic to that food mm -hmm. um that but but what people are usually trying to use are like the igg food sensitivity tests, MRT leap tests. Um, I can't think of any others that are invalidated off the top of my head right now. Is, your um, hair, is hair testing a thing? Uh, oh yeah, hair testing. That's usually not for allergies, but they do it for like vitamin and mineral deficiencies, also not validated. Um, and so like the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has issued a formal statement against the MRT leap tests. Um, the AAAI, which is a group of allergists, immunologists, and something else, um, has issued a formal statement against the use of IgG food sensitivity tests. Uh, they just don't test what they claim to be testing for. So you have to make sure that you're going to the correct practitioner and getting the correct test done. Um, now, gluten allergies have to be- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but typically yeah. this allergist is actually an MD, yes? Um, I think so. Cases. I think so. Yeah. Okay. MD, maybe DO also, but yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Which yep. it means a little something different in the UK. Someone just freaked out. But DO, in the, at least in the States and Canada, is, a, is like a legitimate oh. doctor. Um, but so, but, but you're going to a true medical professional, yes. not someone who calls them like an allergy 
coach. Or yes, whatever. exactly. I coach or, allergies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or in the U.S., like functional medicine practitioner, which is like right. not. Yeah. So you go to an actual doctor. Yes, you go to a medical exactly. professional, and and we know which tests are now contraindicated, and yes. now you can carry on. Um, now, if you're testing for celiac, which is um, gluten allergy, uh, you actually usually you're going to be working with a gastroenterologist for that because you're going to be having really you know severe symptoms leading up to it. They actually will need you to be eating gluten um, leading up to the test, and then they test for specific antibodies, and then they're able to test for right. um, uh, celiac disease. Um, but uh, when you're, um, aside from that, um, you know, you're really looking just at more of the, the intolerances. If you're just having like gas and bloating, it's probably not an allergy. It is probably just an intolerance, meaning you're just not producing the enzyme for that food. And when it comes to fibers, you're not ever going to produce that enzyme. You weren't supposed to. And it's the, just the bacteria, um, metabolizing those fibers. And that's totally normal. You're just, you're farting out their farts. I love it. I think that's a really good place to transition, <laughs> ending on farting out their farts. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think at this stage, w w we've covered a lot of ground. I don't, I don't know if anything else that you wanted to ask about Omar about, but I, I want to open. I do have I have two, but I don't know which oh. one do you want to go. Uh, so two more about well, God. Let's, and then, let's do it. If you, I yeah. didn't know you had two more. You got you got the hot the hot takes today. No man, I uh, so this is one of the things because as you said, uh, Gabrielle, for myself, I grew up. It's it's nothing huge, but I grew up eating a good amount of dairy. And then when mm -hmm. I decided to go uh, in my first lean mass phase, uh, when I was eighteen, I gained just about eighty pounds in ten months. No big deal. Um, oh. I I All was muscle. consuming as one of the, I was that there. All muscle. All my, yeah, yeah. I was, uh, my FFMI was 81. Uh, it was, yeah, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's okay for natural. What, what ended up happening is that dairy was cheaper for me. And so I would consume quite a large quantity. I'm talking like probably four blocks. So I'm, I'm probably talking about three kgs of cheese kilograms. So, wow. uh, yeah, of cheese per week. Cause it was just where we were at Costco and so forth. It was cheaper. And then plus milk and, yogurt and all those things as my protein sources right it was just it was it was a cheaper for me as a student and when i uh balanced it out anyways after about a year i started noticing more so than normal that my face would i would start breaking down in sweats then when i would consume any type of cheese then or what i'm like what the heck and i so I, I i eliminated way down and from that point in time it made me just more curious about these things but i've you know as someone just on the outside trying to learn you hear a lot of different things i'm like wait wait a second and over time i've come to understand just my own gut i'm like wait a second that that gives me a stomach ache you know when i eat it so i find some of this stuff interesting this is actually a field that i wish i knew more about the two questions that i had the first one would be um something like a peanut allergy just to talk about introducing things what you said about uh gluten where um I don't know if it's the rate that's going up amongst children, but the concept of introducing um, something to individuals at an early stage to not build up a tolerance, but it's the absence of that when people have a moderate reaction. Like, can we talk a little bit about some of these food allergies and the potential severity or uh, basically what I heard is that being introduced, even if you have a mild intolerance as a child, you can build up to it. And that's why in places like Israel, uh, where there's a certain uh, candy or snack that is commonly consumed that has uh, peanuts in it, the amount of peanut allergies in Israel is uh, remarkably lower than in the States. Yeah, there actually is some evidence to support that notion. Um, so it's kind of two part. Uh, and I think they actually are changing the recommendations now for um, exposure to peanuts um, at a young age. And I mean, I really don't know a lot about like pediatric nutrition or anything like that. Um, just something that I, I think that I read in like one of my textbooks. Um, and so I think early exposure can actually be helpful. Um, so it, in when we're really, really young, um, in, in infancy, our intestinal tract is not really fully formed. Um, and there are actually pretty loose junctions there. Uh, and it's a little bit more of an aerobic environment, a very different landscape in terms of the microbes that are present and the interactions between um, like the intestines of the uh, uh, or the contents in the intestine and the supporting um, uh, um, 
immune tissue beneath the intestinal cells. So there's a lot more interaction going on there. Um, so there is uh, some some evidence to support the idea that yeah, some early exposure may be better. May be better. Um, there's also some evidence now. There was a, a study that um, I haven't been able to read the whole thing yet, but it just came out the other day, and they have um, th through a bunch of like computational modeling identified a few different um, bacterial strains or, or genera, I can't remember which one it was, but that were lacking in um, uh, infants who had, or in children who had um, severe allergies. And when they uh, transplanted these into, or when they transplanted the, the microbial contents into mice, um, they found that there was a really a huge mo a modulation of like inflammatory tone and specific immune cells. So it could be also that if we are born sort of already um, dysbiotic or born into, you know, to, to parents who had dysbiosis or in a very sterile environment. If you're the bubble boy. If you're the bubble boy, mm -hmm. yeah. That potentially if you're lacking these microbes that you're at greater risk of developing those allergies later on. So, you know, perhaps there is some, you know, even though I think it kind of gets overblown, but I think there is some evidence now that, yeah, maybe if you're born via C-section and then you're not breastfed and you live in a very sterile environment then you are at predis you have a greater predisposition to developing allergies later on whereas if you have you know not those things and you're exposed to foods at an earlier age then maybe you you have some protection against that later that's why i go not with the five second rule but with <laughs> the um i i just eat food off the floor if it yeah, falls yeah. Rule. <laughs> as long as like there's not too hairy you just go ahead and do it if i can get my cat's hairs out of the food mm-hmm well, I mean, then I'm like, you know what? They eat their hair all the time. What's the worst case scenario that happens? They throw up and then the other cat eats that and then he's fine. So mm -hmm. the point is I eat food off the floor. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I find that interesting also what you said, uh, Gabrielle. Not to misquote you, but you said that your uh, gut microbiome is determined largely by your parents. It's hereditary. Is that what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's also behavioral it's, because your your parents are the ones who are choosing what you eat. Yes. No. Yeah. You know, as, as until you actually move out of the yeah. home to some degree, no. and then influence your behavior yeah. the rest of your life. And what's interesting too is in rodent studies when they will have um, they've done generational studies in rodents, so they will have the mother eat um, a fiber deficient diet, and then she her offspring um, they interbreed them, and then those offspring are interbred. And over the years, they actually lose diversity with each mm. subsequent generation, even though they're eating the same diet. It's wow. pretty interesting. That yeah. is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my question building off of that then, uh, the optimal way of eating, if there is such a thing for the individual, is it specific or is there, I guess, any evidence when it comes to, uh, you know, regional differences where I, I'm thinking of uh, basically the indigenous folks that live all the way up in uh, the Arctic, who for thousands of years have subsisted on essentially eating meat then or are largely a ketogenic diet. Like they're, they're the mm. original keto warriors. Um, and the question obviously could be had, is that optimal? But um, they seem to sort of adapt it around that. How important is that individualized component of the, uh, hereditary, you know, either passed down or then what you grow up eating to determining what you should be eating that would be best for your body? Um, I can actually speak directly to the Inuits no. and the um, their their diet because this was actually um, it, this was studied and it's brought up in the Good Gut by the Sonnenbergs, which is a really great book that I have read more than once, um, and I actually recommend it. It's one of the very few gut health books that I would recommend. You heard to hear the um, Good Gut, folks. Yes. So they are researchers um, uh, out of Stanford. They actually researched the microbiome and um, they uh, wrote about this group because a lot of people do think, oh, they just eat like they only eat animal products year round. But actually, there's a portion of the year during which they do eat fruits and vegetables that are available to them and their fiber intake will absolutely shoot up. And they do have there's like anthropo uh, anthropologists have like reported on this um, that they complain about having GI up upset for a couple weeks oh, that yeah. it, it takes time for them to 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 adjust 
And then, um, you know, once that season is over, then they return to the previous diet. And um, the way they explained that was that, yes, there are, um, the, it, it sort of gets to why we may group, why we may cluster by geographic location, because we have microbes that are adapted to that environment. And so they have a microbial profile that is adapted to that environment and, and allows them to um, survive and thrive eating the way that they do. And if you were to transplant one of them to our, you know, one of our um, areas that they may be at great risk of developing gastrointestinal diseases or other diseases that we very easily fight off. And it could yeah. also be why when we travel, we often do experience GI distress because we have a, a biome that is you know, I'm, I'm from the U.S., so I'm going to look like other people from the U.S. I travel around the world and, you know, things aren't awful, but like I can still tell a difference. I'm yeah, kind of no. like, oh, yeah, you know, things aren't quite normal and it takes a while to to get back to the way things were. And that's even with, you know, I do actually use a probiotic when I travel because it's specific for preventing traveler's diarrhea. Um, so so, yeah, it does. Absolutely. You know, there there's definitely an individualized aspect to it. Um, and, and it also shows that we can't necessarily assume that because that group can thrive eating that diet that we would be able to, um, do the same. It is interesting that that, that that's, and this might be speaking too strongly because I'm sure we don't have enough data either way that some of these differences are not in so much as people assume they are genetic, but rather regional and anthropolog anthropological over time. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that an accurate characterization? Yeah. Or at least yeah. on our best, our best data at this, this point. Not yeah. that there aren't any genetic differences. Right, but. right. Because when we look at, you know, even looking at, um, like I had mentioned in my talk today, when we compare West Africans, Native West Africans to African Americans, it really does cluster by region mm -hmm. and not by ethnicity. Right. Mm -hmm. So which I, I found that very interesting. Yeah. We don't see differences here. We just see one nation under the iron. As uh, James Fitzgerald <laughs> told us, he said, hold on to that iron. It's the only thing in the darkness that will keep you alive. And Mr. Fitzgerald, we're listening to you. We're holding on in our girl fittest man. Absolutely. Uh, Omar, did, did you, that cover both your questions or did you get that second one? I'm not, coach, I'm not going to derail this conversation because I find it fast. Honestly, I am going to pick up the good gut, it's called, or is that the what I... The good gut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, I, it's just it's it's an interesting point in time where you think about the globalized food trade, where a hundred mm -hmm. years ago or a hundred fifty years uh, ago, the majority of the population, unless you were seafaring, would have a largely regional food choices that you select, and uh, just the massive differences that are to be had over the last hundred years are just interesting to observe, and, and the abundance of options that we have also is just really cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. absolutely. So this is that point in the podcast where we, not being the experts we bring on, or, or rather the professionals we bring on, mm. uh, we give them the opportunity to chime in on anything that we, they feel we might have left to, to not be covered. So is there anything yeah. that you want uh, to cover before we finish up? Um, I just want to encourage people to, you know, continue learning and keep an open mind, but also be very conservative about the claims that they're making, um, and very cautious about the claims that they're accepting to be true, because this is really like the wild west yeah. or like you know exploring a new frontier we can get reports from people who are coming back from having sailed the ocean and they have some funky maps with some sea monsters drawn on them and we're just left to sort of believe what they have to say because we don't have the evidence necessarily to prove them wrong yet so it's really an exciting area but um you know just be cautious and be prudent and eat your vegetables cool. love it and then, and then where can people find more of your content and, and keep learning from you? Um, so I'm on vitamin, I'm on Instagram and Facebook is vitamin PhD. Um, I also have a section on gut health in the new RP diet book 2.0. I also have videos on RP plus, which is, uh, the subscription to Renaissance periodizations, um, consortium of videos, forums, articles, tons of awesome, um, content there. And, uh, I have a discount code. If you want to use just my last name, Fundero, you can get 20 bucks off of a year subscription to RP plus and, uh, Straya 20 is another one that you can use for, uh, 
percentage off in Australia. E- yeah, <laughs> off of e-templates if you're in Australia. Um, uh, yeah, so check that stuff out and um, book on the horizon. Yes, I was gonna say mm. and keep an eye out for the book that I'm writing. Ooh. So this is gonna be on. Um, I- I'm gonna call it gut science, I think, or gut microbiome science, because gut health has just gone too far to the woo territory. Um, so it's going to be uh, an overview of the data thus far on uh, the microbiome, diet, exercise, and uh, its role in diseases as well. Awesome. Yeah, so keep your eye out for that in uh, 2020. That is the planned year of the release. And uh, Dr. Mike's going to be releasing a book that year too. So it's going to be a big year for RP, mm-hmm. getting those pubs out. Awesome. <laughs> well, congratulations, and we really appreciate your time. I encourage everyone to check out those resources. And now I'm going to kick it over to my man, Omar, with the best outros on the planet. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. Uh, The phrase of the day uh, is eat your vegetables. The word of the day is amorphous, which I love your use of that word, I must say. Um, I want to thank Dr. Gabrielle Fundero for people that want to know how to use that discount code. It's F-U-N, like fun, D-A-R. Oh, correct? Yes. Boom. I want to thank you for being on. I found it fascinating, and I will be picking up that book. I am currently on the journey reading about a book a week, and so that's going to be added onto the list. Coach has me reading a whole bunch about bodybuilding, iron culture, so I know more about striated glutes than I ever could have hoped for. Um, but I, I, nonetheless, I am thrilled. Yeah, but. And so, <laughs> but, 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 uh, I am thrilled. And that is serious. I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode of Iron Culture Podcast. Everything that Gabrielle spoke about will be listed in the description. You can help us out by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. It seriously does help us out. We're currently battling in our health section of the podcast. Um, There are lifting podcasts, yes, but it's mainly inundated with uh, sex podcast so uh you know how to improve your life or gossip no joke like if you look at the health category and uh, self-help guru so we're fighting the good fight folks uh leave a rating or review and if you're on youtube and you enjoyed the video go ahead and leave a like leave a comment we'll do our best to respond and we'll see everyone with a new episode of iron culture history science culture in that next episode every monday peace